we're going to talk about other countries that joined the liberal trend, starting with Colombia. Okay? In the 1840s, the governments restored the Fuero laws. Remember the big exemptions that were given to the uh, church ecclesiastical members? And um, the liberals had eliminated before. So these are the conservatives, right? They inv even invited the Jesuits to come back. Uh, who were expelled from the Spanish America in the 1700s. And when Colombian liberals um, began their comeback in the 1850s, they threw the Jesuits out of uh, Colombia again and moved the Fuero out as well and made uh, tithes voluntary. Remember, tithes are the 10% of your income that you will give to the church. Uh, and they were insisting on the government control over Catholic clergy, even legalizing divorce. So they're making moves towards the liberal uh, side. In 1861, Caudillo, Tomás Cipriano de Mosquera, came to Bogotá to rule for decades as a liberal. So that being Colombia. In Chile, it was governed by three presidents, and none of them were overthrown. And they believe they are conservatives. They but they made a lot of liberal moves. Uh, Joaquin Prieto in 1830s, Manuel Bulnes in the 1840s, and Manuel Mont in 1850s. So uh, jo Joaquin Prieto, Manuel Bulnes, and Manuel Mont. You have to remember those last names, Prieto, Bulnes, and Mont. Can you remember? Prieto, Bulnes, and Mont. And they're in Chile. And stability, um, due to the rigged elections and, you know, export expansion happens at this time. The Mapuches was a small indigenous group, descendants of the Araucanos, who resisted the Spanish, actually, when they came, lived in the south, not part of the national society. Uh, so here you can see a group of Mapuches back in the days uh, with the Spaniards, the indigenous people. And this is the Mapuche today, you can see in the picture. They do a, a lot of protests because their human rights are not as improved still today. The landowners lived in the Central Valley, exporting copper, silver, and wheat. Mont once became a minister, once he was a minister of education, and he made a lot of progressive projects uh, like railroads, telegraphs, waterworks, and schools, and Chilean liberal liberals remained in control for 30 years of order and progress, as you can see. In Central America, we have in the 50s um, that republics had conservative rulers, like the one in Guatemala, Rafael Carrera, uh, then liberals will keep triumphing after, after, after the conservatives. So the liberals will start taking over in Central America as well. In El Salvador, led the way in the 1850s uh, with the liberals. And then uh, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and Honduras followed with the liberal rulers. The only country that resisted was Nicaragua because something happened in Nicaragua. Um, the liberals had a bad reputation because they had invited a U.S. Uh, adventurer. His name was William Walker, and he attempted to colonize Nicaragua for the U.S. For a brief time, he became the president of Nicaragua, and he proclaimed freedom of worship, adoption of English as a language, and he granted lands to U.S. immigrants and legalized even slavery, which is insane. And he was captured and executed in the 1860 uh, by a joint Central American army. And then after that, they would join the trend of liberals in the 1890s. So Nicaragua joined later because of this in incident with uh, William Walker. So there were a lot of limits for progress for women, but liberalism led a you know, women's rights in a positive direction, expanding their education and life opportunities, but few of them really benefited in the 1800s. So let me show you some women who made a difference in this, in this society. So few were famous. Uh, usually they were writers and uh, they will explore 
racial issues of the time. We have Gertrudis Gomez de Avellaneda in Cuba, and she became famous for writing the novel Sab, which was very controversial, and um, it was in 1841, and she wrote it from Spain. And Sab is a story, it's a love story of a Cuban slave that falls in love with a white woman who owns him. But obviously that relationship is not allowed, so she ends up marrying an Englishman who has blue eyes, and he's very cruel to the slaves, including him. And um, at the end, the slave still sacrifices his life for her. You have to read the novel, right? And at the end, the woman realizes that Sab's um, moral, moral superiority is high in spite of him being a slave. So the novel is actually calling for the abolition of slavery. You know how they should look at slaves as human beings who are superior in their moral qualities. So it's very interesting how she makes the population look at Cuba in a different view. But it was a very controversial uh, novel at the time. Uh, there's the Ten Years' War from 1868 to 1878. Cuba is fighting for independence from Spain. The Spanish forces, though, were able to contain the eastern part of Cuba away from the big plantations. And you will see that uh, they gain independence uh, in 1898, so 20 more years later. During the war, a Cuban revolutionary newspaper in New York reprinted Sab, the story, for uh, the patriot readers, right, the Cubans. It made the readers explore the meaning of their society's uh, racial divisions. Juana Manuela Gorriti is Argentinian, and she won her fame for writing um, a lot of feminine, instructive, uh, I guess, writings dealing with women's issues. She, her story says that she was eight when she entered a convent school. And at the time, the caudillo, who was ruling Facundo Quiroga, forced her family, because he was, she, they had a liberal family, to emigrate to Bolivia. And at the age of 15, she married a dark man. So remember, in Argentina, you will see later, they have a big European immigration. So even her last name, probably, it's, uh, you know, I'm thinking Italian. There was a lot of Italian immigration. And she actually married a dark man. His name was Manuel Isidro Belsu, who one day became president of Bolivia, and, he, and she had three daughters. But her husband abandoned her after nine years. So she moved to Peru, and she started organizing tertulias. And tertulias are like um, gatherings. Usually you have a you know, drink like tea or coffee, and you talk about literature and society and economy and progress in this case. Um, so it was something that women didn't do back then. Remember, we were supposed to just be home, be a housewife, taking care of children and all that. But she was having all these gatherings where they would talk of things that were more intellectual. And she was divorced and later had more children, I guess, without marrying. And she was supposed to be an outcast, huh? of the society. Clarin Clorinda Mato de Turner in Peru, she's another woman who wrote a novel that will be very controversial. She was not quite 15 when she married in 1871, and she wrote a book called Birds Without a Nest in 1889, and it's a novel about indigenous people, and the story is very interesting. It talks about an interracial affair so remember, Saab talked about a love affair between a uh, slave and a you know uh, European descent woman. Here we have a white man, a European descent man, who is in love with an indigenous woman. So they're not allowed to be together. So the woman is an orphan whose parents died during you know trying to defend themselves. They say from the abusive whites, and the author uh, shows how. Um, they cannot be married because at the end they find out that they have the same father. 
Can you imagine the scandal? They're all both coming from the same fab father. And the father turns out to be the priest. So they're exposing the immoral corruption of priests. Um, you know, by telling the story of love of these two, you know, interracial, you know, kind of couple. And, you know, they end up being the the children of the same womanizing priest, showing the corruption of the church. So she was very controversial. And because of that, she was um, uh, deported from Peru and had to live in Argentina as an educator. So, you know, it's a very controversial novel. Uh, these women focus on attention on ed education and literacy or on race and on the importance of the U.S. and European models in liberal visions of progress. 